we fail, the war will resume and future generations will surely hold us accountable. The world had seen nothing like it as soldiers, sailors, airmen from a remarkable 30 odd nations converged on Bosnia. We offer the chance of something that everybody wants, peace. and they are going in to effectively stabilise Bosnia. They're taken over from the UN Protection Force or UN Pro 4, which had been there previously. Now, unlike the UN, there was increased numbers, there was increased firepower, uh, and these were component multinational battle groups and brigades that could support each other. Within a year, they were going to hand over to the Stabilisation Force, S4, uh, as it was known as, uh, and they were going to be basically take through uh, a policy of peace enforcement, so they were going to actually be able to, 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 if necessary, take the fight to the warring factions if they were risking violating the, the Dayton Peace Accords as well. So the ARC themselves, they knew they had a year-long mandate to implement this as well, and they had different aspects of, of troops on the ground. What further complicated things is not all of the soldiers and units that were being brought in as, with the ARC were, were brand new. Some of them were already in country. And one of the challenges the ARC had was both relocating, reorganising, extracting some forces that had been there under the, the UN profile banner, but then reintegrating others that were staying on and carrying over. Of course, another challenge, despite all the, the very real challenges of, of, of armed groups that were engaged in, in horrific violence that the, the soldiers were being drawn into, was actually the weather and the conditions in Bosnia at the time as well. Um, Bosnia's roads were not particularly well developed. Um, winter in Bosnia uh, in particular and, and, and the whole of that region is incredibly harsh, lots of snow, lots of ice. So these were big challenges as well, let alone they were entering a humanitarian crisis um, of which roads would be incredibly important for moving both men and, and material but also humanitarian supplies as well. I think one of the things we should remember most about the deployment of Bosnia is just its sheer scale. You know, you're looking at really its peak, about 55,000 troops from 35 countries under the ARC's command. You know, this is a, a major multinational effort that brings its own challenges of working with all these different cultures of, of organisation of, of working. But you know, I think that's one of the real benefits that the ARC has always had. It's been multinational in its outlook, and so it's been easy to grow or expand to bring in and integrate these different units, these different components, and be really effective on the ground. My first experience was 95 and I was on the OP when we moved from Sipovo towards Makonichgrad and then finally on and upwards to Banja Luka. Um, the OPs were tasked with going out uh, and painting what was then known as the zone of separation. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, Does that ring a bell? Yeah. The zone. Remember I remember deploying out with tins of orange paint. Um, you know, looking at the engineer mine trace, understanding where we could and couldn't go. Uh, and then departing with a, a very brief set of orders to sort of paint and highlight where the zone uh, was going to go in our area of expertise and our area of operations. And, and literally painting things orange to depict who sat on one side yeah. of the fence and who sat on the other. Yeah. Well, of course, that's when I went out, was what the, the OP spent all their time doing, was patrolling those, um, that, the zone of separation. Yeah. And um, we had troops deployed, it was French up in the north west I think to remember uh, and they were deployed up there and, and the Czechs I think we had out there at the same time uh, and they were patrolling all that while we were in the guns loop just patrolling the guns all the time but it was it was a really interesting as a young lad that whole idea of you of painting a line through a country mm. and keeping two sides completely separate I suppose we should have been used to it because of the Berlin Wall at the time but it was yeah. still a totally alien concept. No, absolutely. When I went back in 1997, this time much more towards Sarajevo, the gun group still again very much in um, in Sipovo, but the OP is now working with the Dutch up yep. in the Vitez pocket in Sisava. Do you remember going down in that direction just once on my tour and it was during the summer by that point and I just remember thinking how stunning the countryside was down there. Mm. It was the most gorgeous location mm. uh, and absolutely fascinating. And then you just see the destruction that had gone on Absolute. around it. It was um, heart-wrenching to see. Especially in places like the Vitez pocket. Yeah, yeah. You know, where you had that mixed sort of Croatian, Muslim, Serbian 
all very close yeah. proximity to each other and just well, and that was the other thing I, I do remember was um, even you know, two or three years later when I was there was you, you'd go out and, on patrol and there would still be houses being uh, burnt down yeah. so in the middle of a village one house would suddenly be burnt down yeah uh, and there's that it was trying to understand how those people living those differences were living so close together mm. and still struggling even you know, two or three years later mm. and, yeah, and uh, losing the battle I guess but um, it, was, it was quite weird to see that in close up suddenly they would lost the rule of Tito yeah and you know there was just pilferage and pillaging and all kinds I think, of I think my point was, was when we went, so I was in, you know, back in 97, you kind of thought it was all largely done and dusted, i.e. that anyone that was going to move had moved uh, and the new boundaries had been drawn and mm. it was all, you know, it was, a, it was a status quo, and it was a status quo, largely. But it was that, it was that idea that there were still certain areas where mm. a particular household would be targeted still all those years later. Mm -hmm. um, it was, was really strange to see. And you then, you were there for the change from when it went from UN to NATO? Yeah, exactly that. And I think this picture sort of helps show the sort of UN white vehicles, you know, the Union flag flying on the back of the uh, Warrior OPV yeah. slash Warrior infantry variant. Um, and yeah, we were there as uh, UN gunners uh, prior to then going into the I-4 period. Um, so it's very, very key change of posture as well, wasn't it? Because before that, it was, I remember from watching the news before I went out, it was all roadblocks trying to get uh, convoys to and Absolutely. Right, so, and overnight it suddenly changed to, um, you know, NATO Different is in posture. town, we're, we're going straight through yeah. route direct. The Allied Rapid Reaction Corps has been certified as NATO's warfighting corps headquarters. This means we are ready to deploy at short notice anywhere in the world on large-scale operations up to and including high-intensity warfighting. The ARC has a proven track record of commanding NATO operations in Bosnia, Kosovo, and as recently as Afghanistan. Alongside our allies, we sit at the heart of defense and deterrence of our European Atlantic Alliance. The ARC was ready years ago for the I-4 mission and stands ready again today. NATO training and readiness testing sends a message to any adversaries that we are credible and capable force with high quality staff who are trained and practiced in their core role.